So today's cardinal lesson, we're talking about something that personally for me is very important. And we're talking about you creating a long-term care plan. And we're, the plan is not insurance. So those are two different things. Or the insurance can be part of the plan. But what I want to impress upon you today is the need to create a plan in your 60s for when you're in your 80s and 90s. Because, you know, like for me personally, if this long-term care thing happens to me, if I'm needing care and needing help, uh, the way I look at it is if it happens in my 70s, or even the rest of my 60s, my wife is going to be able to be the point person. She's still not going to have to care for me uh, with the stuff like bathing and dressing and meals. And I guess she's going to do the shopping and she's going to probably prepare some of the meals. But we go out to eat a lot now. You can tell that just by looking at me. And um, appointments, she's probably going to do that. Um, She's probably going to go do recreation on her own. But my point is, if I had a stroke or developed dementia, you know, my preference is to be taken care of at home and to not go to an assisted living or a nursing home, um, but yet to receive the care at home and to bring in professional help to help her. And if that's in the 70s, she's going to be the quarterback of the whole thing. She's going to be making the financial decisions doing all that. But, you know, the odds of this happening to me in my 70s or her is lower. I mean, the reality is, is if this happens and care is needed for an extended period of time, it's going to probably be in the 80s and the 90s. And she is not going to be in a position to take care of me all by herself. She may not even be in a position to make financial decisions depending on timing and everything is, is the way it goes. So what we're talking about is a long-term care plan, is a plan. And I've got the elements in a plan listed down here. But what I'm really wanting to accomplish today is to impress upon you the need to get a written long-term care plan. Like if, if I'm not able to take care of myself, who is going to take care of me? And in what way do I want them to take care of me when I'm in my 80s and 90s? Okay. And then, so we're going to start out with the healthcare power of attorney. And, you know, we put that first because this is the person who is going to make all the healthcare decisions about whether I'm cared for at home or I have to go to an assisted living. I mean, I may not have that choice, but. This is the person, if, I, you know, if I'm of sound mind, I can make that decision myself. But many people, when they're in this, they need somebody to act legally on their behalf. And you know, for us, on my healthcare power of attorney, it has my wife. She's my power of attorney, and I'm hers. So that was pretty simple. But that's not the most important person on that document, is the backup or the stand-in or the step-up is my oldest son on both of ours. So if she is not able to be the healthcare power of attorney, it's going to be my oldest son. And if he's not able to do it, it's going to be my younger son. And so we're fortunate. We have two sons that are responsible enough that they're going to be able to take care of this. And keep in mind, they're going to be 20 years older than they are now. And a lot of folks just kind of think, well, these kids, they'll take care of me. And, you know, I was just in preparing for this show, talking to the guy that helps us with this. I said, are your daughters going to give up their careers to move back to North Carolina and move in with you and take care of either you or your wife? And of course not. He wouldn't want that. But you'd be surprised how many people when I start to talk with them and giving consulting, they're either saying it or they're thinking it, well, my kids will take care of me. Or they're thinking my spouse will take care of me. That's one of the things that we do for each other in married. And I'm just saying that neither one of those are very good options 
of course they're going to take care of you and they're going to be there and they're going to be the point person, but they need the ability to hire professional help to come in and do certain things. And so that healthcare power of attorney, spouse first, somebody 20 years or more younger than you, if you don't have children to be the second person, or you're not married, um, you're single, and you don't have children, well then a nephew or a niece or another trusted person is, th this is very important. They're gonna, they're gonna make these decisions for you in, in, when you're not able to. So, and then, you know, I, I put down, is it, do you want, is your preference home care like mine is? Or is it assisted living? And, you know, Tom, you had something to say about this where you had talked about what some single people's preference is. So we, we want to hear from Tom. Sure. And so, you know, what I view our job is, is to help people make the plan to meet their specific goals. It is not our job to tell them what their goals should be. And so most people come in and they want to stay at home. Their goal is to stay at home as long as possible. But more and more now, we're getting people who are single, they might be divorced or, uh, or widowed. Um, they're coming in and their goal is to go to an assisted living. They would prefer to go somewhere where they have a community, some people there of similar age that they can be around versus staying at home. I mean, being at home by yourself can be quite lonely. And so um, when we're going through this and making up, helping people make this long-term care plan, we want to be real clear of what it is they want, because what our job is to help them meet that goal. Our job is to help them do, you know, what their wishes are and help really their family or whoever this healthcare power of attorney is, um, get them their wishes. Well, yeah. And it's, so when you, we talk about single people uh, and sometimes married people, many times married people, you have this option of independent living. There's a lot of independent living facilities out there that people think are assisted living. And a lot of the independent living facilities have an assisted living on premises, but you know, that single person that you just described that really wants to be around other people, they don't necessarily wanna live alone when they get old and they need care. This is an option as well, is to go to an independent living. Now, the insurance typically is not going to pay for an independent living. An independent living is generally less, less expensive and provides a lot more social and recreational services than an assisted living. But they don't provide the care. But if you have, like my mother went into a very nice independent living facility for about a year and a half. And during that year and a half, she needed home health care, but she still qualified for the independent living. They had home health care on site so they could come visit you for 15 minutes and charge accordingly. And so we, we didn't have 15, we had 30 minute visits and we had about three or four a day. So it added up to about two hours and they were just down the hall. She had her own little apartment. So there's all kinds of care facilities available and you need to at least have in writing or you've expressed this where somebody can read it of what your preferences are. And there's no guarantee that what you, like I prefer to be at home, it may be whatever happens to me or whatever state that I'm in, it may not be possible to care for me at home. So this isn't any guarantee that's exactly the way it's going to play out, but this is really helpful. I spend a fair amount of my time meeting with people that are in their 80s and 90s, mostly 80s, and some event, some healthcare event has just happened to them, a crisis. And who brings me in there are the kids who are in their 50s and 60s, or one of the kids who finds me, and then I'm meeting with the whole family, and we're bringing a lawyer in typically, and we're trying to reconstruct this plan and then figure out how we're going to pay for it when it's really happening. And a lot of that involves talking mom and dad or mom or dad into going along with whatever we think is best for them and then spending their own money. 
And that can be difficult for somebody who's very well off and they dismissed all of this discussion while they were in their 60s so that they could, they just say, well, we've got enough money. When that happens to us, we'll just pay for it. Go try to talk to an 85-year-old dude into spending thousands of dollars of his own money or her own money, the lady, to bring in caregivers that he thinks all they do is watch TV all along and eat his food. So uh, that doesn't go too well. So we need to write down our wishes for care. I mean, we need to write down, like, who do I want to take care of me? How do I want them to take care of me? And when I'm talking about things like bathing, dressing, meals, shopping, appointments, recreation, all of that stuff is very important to somebody who's 80 or 90 and they can't care for themselves. And at the level of it, to at least have an understanding of what it is you wish if you're just looking forward to your 85-year-old self. Now, with the financial plan, the financial power of attorney many times is the exact same person as the healthcare power of attorney. I mean, look, if your spouse, something happens to you in your 70s and your spouse is also in your 70s or his 70s, then they can probably just live up to being a good healthcare POA and a good financial POA and you can just keep the kids or the seconds and the thirds out of it. So in the 70s, that works fine. But when you get into the 80s, like if it happens to me in my 80s, I know that my wife, at the very least, is going to be consulting both of my sons and looking to them for help in exercising her financial POA, or she may just turn it over to them and just say, you, you do this. Uh, you know, this is not me. And the financial POA is just how are you going to pay for all these things that you've asked for? How are we going to spend your money, pay your bills, uh, look after you, uh, look after the healthy spouse, you know, look after the home. If we got to sell the home, uh, if we've got to go somewhere, if we're going to go into an independent living, all of that stuff, it's much more helpful if the kids or the adult kids, the caregivers, have the legal authority to make the decisions that they need to make. So, and then we need to write down how we're going to pay for care with your money. So we get a lot of people that say, I have enough money. I'll just pay for it. I'm not buying any of that long-term care insurance. And my suggestion is if that's where you are, examine it. So it's just because if you have a lot of money, it doesn't necessarily make the situation great 20 years from now, because just thinking your daughter, your son, the combination of them, I mean, they may not know what money to spend, what money to use, what whether they should pull that from an IRA or other assets or sell real estate or sell a business, um, whether you should go to an assisted living, which one. So it's important for you to just, this can be a simple document. I can help you with it. Um, to write down what I want, who I want to make the decisions, how I want to get care delivered to me. And then within the money, what are the tax implications? You know, I see people on both sides. I see people go and take money and they sell stock in a mutual fund or they sell assets to pay for care. That has tax implications. Or they pull the money out of the IRA that has huge tax implications when, you know, if you pull the money out of the IRA and you actually spend it on care, you can take a tax deduction for the care that you spend. I don't want to get, that's another video, but point being, you need to have this stuff written down of who's going to make the decisions. And by the time we get somebody to this point, maybe they were rejecting long-term care insurance. But when they get to this point, they say, you know, maybe it's going to be easier on my daughter or son or my spouse if we've got some basic long-term care insurance in force and that they're just going to say, who's going to pay for this? The insurance company is. 
And with that, I want to turn it over to Tom to talk about a specific client that we're just dealing with, a couple. Yeah, so I'll make a couple points and then we'll get into the case that we're working on here is when we're writing down the long-term care plan, that is different than having the legal documents, having the power of attorneys in place. Those are important. You need those documents in place, but that's separate from the plan itself. Is the plan it tells them what to do, the legal documents give them the authority to enact that plan. So, I, you know, some people will bring this up and they say, oh, I have the power of attorneys already. Great, you need those, but you still need a separate plan instructing them what to do with those power of attorneys. So I think that's important. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to walk through a client and it's a couple that came in and they really were, they were already to the point where they were concerned about this. They wanted to put a plan together and they wanted to use insurance to help fund the care that they might need in the future. And so this particular policy is, is a very robust policy. It, it is a lot of benefits and I'll, I'll walk you through how we arrived at the amounts we did. But um, what this policy does is we use some of their IRA or 401k money, money they have not paid taxes on yet to fund this policy. And so on this screen, you can see what they do is an initial premium. And let me actually show you that the initial premium is $350,000 of IRA money or 401k money. And, and this, this couple was, was well off. They had the money. They could afford to do this. What they get in turn for that is a death benefit of three sixty six dollars um, if they don't need care. Um, if neither one of them needs care, they would get a death benefit of $366,000 to their beneficiaries. Um, if they need care, they actually bought unlimited benefits. They bought lifetime benefits where the care would last the rest of their life. And so what we did for them is we said, okay, one of the things that are on Hans's board was projecting the cost of care. As we looked forward and the care that they were looking at, home health care, assisted living, we were projecting that cost to be right around $11,000 in the future. It's still a projection that it, there is a scenario, it could be more than that, but that's what we were projecting. And so we solved for a benefit that would be $11,000 of future money that they would need into the future. And then we added a lifetime rider. So the care would last for as long as either one of them lived. It could never run out. How this actually works is you say, oh, I'm using IRA money you know, what does this look like? And so what the insurance company is doing is they're taking the $350,000 of IRA money and they put it into an annuity at the insurance company. And then that annuity pays out 10 annual payments of $42,000 into the life insurance policy. So it's paying the life insurance policy and it's paying the long-term care rider. And then after 10 years, that money has been distributed from the um, annuity. It's come out of the long term or the IRA money. It's in the life insurance and they have a paid up long term care policy that will cover both the husband and the wife for long term for lifetime um, for long term care. Hey, Tom, I wanted to add something that that's 11,000 a month right. of benefit available to both of them for lifetime. That's right. unlimited. So if both needed care at the same time. It would pay out the tw it would pay out twenty two thousand. It would double that, and you could potentially be receiving the twenty two thousand um, dollars at the you know in a single month if both qualified for care. So they were on board. They said, "Okay, let's do this." We put in an application, and then lo and behold, the wife gets declined. Which is there is an underwriting component to these long term care policies. The insurance company want to make sure that you're healthy enough to take. And she wasn't. She got turned down. And so now we're stuck with the, the issue that they're on board with this plan. They still think it's an issue, but only one of them qualified for the benefits. And so we went back and, and showed them, OK, if we just offer this policy on the husband, it takes less money because it's only covering one person as opposed to two. Um, and so we ran for the same benefits, the same 11,000 a month benefits. And from the IRA and supposed to 350, it took 225 for him. And so it's much less money going in. It only covers one of them, but he has the same benefits that we were proposing for both of them. So it's lifetime benefits at the $11,000 a month um, amount, and it's just covering him. And so he was on board with that. Um, I mean, all the numbers, the policy works the same way. It's just reduced. Um, but then the problem was, what do we do for the wife? Because the wife still has the need. Um, 
the case could be made her need is even more than the husband by the fact the insurance company turned her down is there's a higher likelihood she might need this care in the future. And so we went back to the drawing board and came up with a proposal using what's called short-term care. So it's not lifetime benefits. It's not like this policy, but the biggest factor was she could qualify as we looked at all the health questions and she is able to purchase this policy. And so how this policy works is it will provide a year worth of care at home, 52 weeks at home, and then a year worth of care at a facility, so assisted living. So if you used both benefits, it would be a two-year policy, which would be very helpful if this were to happen to them, to give them two years to kind of get everything else in order where they might have to start paying after that point. The benefit at home is $1,200 a week for 52 weeks. So it would pay that amount for 52 weeks. And then the facility benefit, so this would be like an assisted living, a nursing home, anywhere that you're having to go somewhere. We, we maxed out the benefit. It was 300 a day or 9,000 a month to help pay for, for care at a facility. And so it is less benefits than the hybrid policy, the one previously. However, it's one she can qualify for. It really solves a huge need for them and it's, it's much less expensive. So the premium for her on this policy was $171 a month. And so it's an ongoing cost. You pay that monthly, but um, it, it's a very, very beneficial benefit for her. And to tie this all back into what Hans was talking about is this is a way to fund the plan that they've put in place is they want to stay home. They want to, you know, if they have to go somewhere, they'd rather go to assisted living. Both of these policies are a way to help give them the money to do this where they don't have to spend their other money um, on the care if it arises. That's terrific. I mean, it, uh, and for these people, we, we have a third element that we did for them is we're, you know, we're financial planners, both Tom and I are CFPs and we're handling and putting together a retirement plan for them and we're handling their income. And we have a way that we've set up a future income with some of their IRA money because they've got a lot of it. And it has an enhanced long-term care benefit for both of them. So th there's a way for what are uninsurable people, which in this case, it was the wife, to get certain products that we offer where they can still get some type of insurance benefit. And so we can take the short-term care, which is a great policy in and of itself, but then if there's care needed beyond that for her, we've got their retirement plan or their retirement income with a monthly income set up that they'll get an enhanced check if either one of them is using long-term care, but we're only going to use that for her. So it's, you know, it's really, and so we're finishing this video where we're talking about long-term care insurance, but I wanna go back to the beginning and I just wanted to point out, I wanna impress upon you that these are solutions. You need a plan whether you buy insurance or not. You need a plan for what are you gonna do? What do you want done if either you or your spouse, if you're married, are not able to take care of themselves? And how do you want your care handled? And how do you want it paid for? and out of what money, and how do you want to care for the surviving spouse after you pass on? Um, that's all interconnected. So I'm Hans Scheil. And I'm Tom Griffith. And we both thank you very much for listening. Thank you.